start with a question about, in the introduction you talked about um, Egyptian cinema and how, that, how it all began for you. Um, and yet, I, I think we have, in the States we have a very, very partial view of, of what Egyptian cinema is, but we tend to associate it with more of melodrama. But you've made a film that I think is the, the opposite of that. In fact, I think what's really powerful about the film is how restrained it is. But melodrama can be restrained as well. In the way I, I looked at it, it's, it, you know, I, I'm coming from a poor family in Morocco, and the, the Egyptian movies were the only culture left for us. Uh, because the, film, the Egyptian films were, we could see them on Moroccan TV, and, um, and actually we loved them very, very much, my, my sisters and me. Not only my sister and me, but I think the whole Arab people are very much in, uh, and still in love with what was produced in Egypt. Um, the Arab film, Egyptian films, are called in Arab world Arab films because they represent and they symbolize something very important in all what is happening in the Arab world. So the Arab film, it was Friday night, and we were waiting all week long for that moment where the Arab images were appear. And I think during that whole time where I was waiting more than the others for, for the l'apparition, for these images to appear, is very important because that's the time where I kept, um, um, of course, dreaming and fantasizing about these images but at the same time rethinking about the images I, I watched the past week, the past month. And I think cinema, uh, of course uh, cinema is, 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 a, is a question of uh, uh, position from where you see what you are about to, to film, but exactly as well, where were you when you were when you saw that film and whom the people were with you. So the, the, the Arab films for me, because they were spoken uh, in Arabic, they were talking about things we were not supposed to talk about in uh, my family and, and Morocco. And I'm not talking here about homosexuality or anything, but especially the actresses, the Egyptian actresses, were so brave and so um, beautiful and and, and brave at some time because they were talking about the. I mean, with their own bodies, they were represent, representing things that, that were real in the Arab world, but that were very, very hard to find the right place in the real life where to talk with or to discuss about. So, I'm talking about this thing, about the Egyptian movies, because you know, when you, you were born in a, in a poor family, or poor, you, it's impossible to imagine uh, that you will succeed to overcome this poverty and will become these things you, you dream about. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I was spending all my time thinking and rethinking about these images, that's what created, I think, the desire of cinema in me. And I think even the distance with the images, the, the distance that is in my film, the, the, the story, I think it's coming from there because these images, these Arab images, were, were um, in our house, among our house, with my sisters and my mother and my father, but yet they, they are still like, they, they, there, were, there was something in, in Morocco that, that was saying we should not recognize them as a reality. I don't know if it's clear or not clear. It's just the fact that Egypt, it's all of what you have to understand, that for the poor gay boy that I was, luckily for me there was Egyptian movies, the stars, the belly dancing, the songs, all those things, they were there, and they didn't even think of them in, a, in, a, in, a, in an intellectual way. They were just there for the poor people, and luckily they were there. Because if, if there were no Egyptian movies, there would be no, no me today. 
Uh, were those movies uh, sort of conscious influences or reference points for you when you were making the film? Um, well, there, there, there is, there is um, uh, homage, yes, a direct homage in yeah, the film. And the, clip. the song, yeah. The song is coming from a popular film. It's the singer Abdel Halim Hafid singing that song. In, in a popular Egyptian film called Ayam Wa uh, Days and Nights, and it's story of brothers, of two brothers too. Uh, so, the, I don't know, it's... Uh, uh, of course, I were thinking about the, 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 these influences, but not in... I was not obliged, I didn't feel obliged to... to put these influences as they were. Mm -hmm. But to rethink about the position where I was when I discovered these films. And I was thinking and rethinking about them again. Because I think in this process of thinking, you, 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 can, you can create your own way, you can put your own reality in the same, the same uh, uh, images. And I mean, and, and I, I always repeat that Egyptian movies are very important because that's why that's all I had until the age of 19. Mm -hmm. What happened after 19? It's something else. I became more clever and I discovered Jean-Luc Godard, etc. <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I became, I mean, kind of adults. I could discuss with people and I could manipulate them and do whatever I wanted with them. <laughs> well, some, not all of them. <laughs> but the most important thing, I think we could all agree here, the most important part of any life is what happened in the early age. And what were the, what the sky gave you, <laughs> what, uh, what, where your mother was when you were discovering this, and where was the father, and what, what about the big brother. And I do remember that every time that I use, I watch an Egyptian movie and find them, the, the, most of them were melodramas. But I have nothing against melodramas. I love it very, very much. And actually, one of the greatest filmmakers here in America, he was German, Douglas Sirk, when he created the best, one of the best, best films ever, uh, Imitation of Life, uh, Magnificent Secret, uh, All I Desire. Uh, What's the other one with rock and um, All that heaven allows. And when you see, <laughs> see that on stage, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, like you are eating honey. <laughs> but, but at the same time, there are true great films, masterpieces. And, um, so I have no... Uh, so maybe I don't answer directly your question, but for me, the distance, that's very important, the distance, I do remember exactly where I was sitting when I discovered this and this film and what I could do and how I managed not to cry next, sitting next to my sister and I had to wait when the dark, when we were all sleeping and to cry without sound, etc. This, I think this, this, uh, I, I can see clearly where was where was and where is my body when I discovered something. And the distance is very important, not only in cinema, because that's where you you can see things differently, and that's where for the cinema where you can you know where to put uh, the camera and how many uh, do you want decoupage many Edit yeah. or just plan sequence, camera things, fixed camera, etc., etc. And I think I learned all that before Jean-Luc Godard and Robert Bresson in those early uh, that, that that early age when I had only those those images to see, to be involved, to think about in a very well, uh, be more. naive way, but still true way. Could you talk a, a bit about the process of, um, you, you wrote a book called Salvation Army um, about eight, eight years ago, eight, nine years ago. Um, do you consider this uh, 
an adaptation, or or were you, or is this some, not not exactly that? Because it, it seems like I, I've read the book, and it seems like you reimagined it in a way instead of you know translated it to this game. No, uh, for me, although I wrote several books, uh, every time I, I start to write, book, I, the only the only uh, the, the the first. Um, Desire, someone desire. But, uh, I feel like always words are not enough, and actually words are not enough. What human beings invented as words, it's not enough to communicate and to say everything you want. And when I start writing, I I have always to fill the same words I'm using all the time with something. Uh, I'm not going to say new, but uh, with with some beliefs in, in order to, to do it. So, when I started uh, writing the screenplay, which is an adaptation, but this adaptation was not really one, because I didn't even reread the book, and uh, I had no intention to stay faithful to the book. It didn't even mean anything to me. To do. What, I don't know. I, I didn't see myself uh, taking the book which I wrote many years ago, and it's with the autobiographical material, and to study it, and to cut, and to take this. And actually the first producer who came to see me and said that we should do film out of this book, I said to him no, because I was not at all, I didn't know, I didn't know if I was um, capable of this thing called adaptation. And some months later, I realized that they could easily forget forget about the book, and that's where um, it's not that it's not that I remember. I the distance I had when I wrote this book with Egyptian cinema came back, and everything I wrote in the screenplay, meaning no explanation, just to be some scenes that are there. No words, but many things are happening. That's 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 how um, that's how I did it, and uh, I, I invented something else, which is a film, not uh, not a book at all. But would you consider it um, autobiography? I don't know. Uh, it's not autobiography in the meaning that I. I had to, again to stay to something that was really true in my real life, etc., etc. No, but it is autobiographical because it's. I had uh, six sisters, two brothers. I had six sisters, two brothers, and we were living something the same that you you, you saw in, in the film. But again, it's uh, like book. It's 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 construction. It's work, and. When you construct, you allow yourself things that were not happening in real life. And that is very important to allow yourself. So one more question for me before I take some from the audience. You, you wrote a piece, um, an essay that was published um, uh, among other places in the New York Times uh, a couple of years ago um, about growing up gay in Morocco. And one thing you said in that piece was that you had to kill yourself, you kill your younger self. Um, and I'm wondering if the process of making this film is in any way about bringing that younger self back to life or reconciling yourself with your younger self in some way? Well, uh, when I was a little, I was very much disillusioned. I'm not anymore, that's what they say. But that's, <laughs> <laughs> but that's too bad for me. I wish I was still disillusioned. Because um, I have nothing against it. I think, no, if someone is effeminate, if he's happy or he's that way, why not? But, like, unlikely for me that I had to cut, again, it's always about cutting and taking things off. I had, because the response from the society where I was living was so harsh and, uh, and I was like, I was pushed in a corner where all men could um, have sex with me. Uh, uh, so I had to, to separate myself from this world, and the only the first decision was to 
this is sad to say, uh, to stop being effeminate, which is uh, something uh, very, I think, very, very sad because, like, and I, I wrote this in, in, in that piece, because now I'm 14, and uh, when I meet like first people, they say, "Oh, you don't look, you don't look at all gay." And I don't understand what that means. Because I think it's it's, uh, it's an insult somehow. Uh, and they are happy that they have a gay friend who doesn't look gay. <laughs> I mean, and I think this is a compliment. <laughs> uh, and when I heard this, it means that I succeeded, that I achieved that process of killing uh, that little boy. That, uh, because I do remember that I was dancing with my sisters, uh, doing a lot of free things that were my free memories, free, uh, and, and saying, and by free, I say that, and again, it's not, and then for me, it's very important uh, that the memories have nothing intellectual, that only these, these things that somehow there is some power that make that makes the people do things that seem to be crazy and they are not. And I believe that I had many crazy experiences with my sister and, and my big brother too. And but it seems like now these memories are not anymore uh, valid or uh, for them or um, I don't know what what's, what uh, uh, no, so I didn't do at all this film uh, in order to reconcile with that little boy. I think it's too late to reconcile with him or, or with anyone. Uh, because, as I told you earlier, it's when you... The only way I, I had to save myself for Egyptian movies and live... Some years later, I discovered that I discovered they can be very intelligent and very clever, and I can manipulate people as I want to. And I started manipulating people, and uh, and constructing something very much intellectual, very much intellectual, maybe too much. Uh, but that was in my real life as a human being, constructing something in, in the real society. When I was making the film, I tried not to be intellectual, but to to go back to something is that is was the essence of life, and that essence for me was before I killed that little boy. Well, it's a sad answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, your comment tonight, Where? Trump, here. Yeah. Your comment tonight prompted me to think that through your career as a writer, you were always at heart a filmmaker. Totally. And I'd like to know how you think, how your audience is engaged in your writing, especially at home in Morocco, and whether your family and friends and people in Morocco have engaged with this film in the same way, whether you have a new audience because of the film that you've done. I'll, I'll just repeat that our question, an uh, observation that uh, Dylan, even though he's as long been a writer, is also always, um, I guess, a filmmaker at first. Uh, and whether this film has shown in Morocco, is that your? Right. Whether the audience for his work has changed since he's um, now also a filmmaker. I think it's worth pointing out that you write in French. Yes, I write in French, but that's not the, the language of my family. Right. Moroccan people yeah. don't speak all French language. It's a mistake. I know that in America all people, you think no, that's that... Why I you, yeah, I know. Yeah. And poor people don't speak Ar French, they speak Arabic. So I grew up and I studied in Arabic. I decided, that's one of the decisions, the decisions I took when I was 13 because I understood that French language would be a good weapon uh, to ac achieve something and to go one day to Paris to study films. It's from, because it's all studied for me, even working <coughs> with, with, with films. So the film will come out in France in, uh, in May, 7th of May. We showed the film in Morocco and Tangiers uh, last month. It was tough, but we did it in a, a national film festival. We haven't found yet a distributor, but uh, I can tell you that they all know about the film because this is the first 
Moroccan film with the, with the hero who is gay. And the film, I guess, will be released on, D on DVDs, something maybe on November or December in France, and it will go immediately to Moroccan markets in pirate versions. <laughs> because they are the specialists of that. And I'm very happy, and I'm very much happy <laughs> in advance, because I know they will all want to see this film, although they, some seem to hate it, but it, it, uh, this film will be in Morocco, for sure. <coughs> About my family, it's very complicated, because I guess for them this film would be like a betrayal. Um, I try not to think about <laughs> what they would react, how they would react. It's, it's hard not to think about that. But I pretend like this doesn't exist. Because I, I don't know. It's me, it's my life, and I cannot keep thinking about the reaction of people. Because their reactions, I can analyze it uh, clearly. Because the society, there is no place where you can be totally free as a human being, as a body, as a spirit, well, gay or straight. So, when, I guess when they will see my film, they will be shocked with some scene, etc. But believe it or not, for me this film is very innocent. For me, I, there is not, nothing provocative in this film. I think the provocation is not, it's only in, in, this, in the eyes of the one who is seeing the images and thinking this should not be happening. But he is only reflecting what society is thinking instead of him. When I was doing this film, writing it, I, I don't see anything uh, provocative. I understand that for some people it is provocative, but I didn't write it, I didn't direct it, I didn't make it to say, okay, let's provoke Morocco, let's show them the, that homosex, homos, homosexual sex, let's show them things that are forbidden. It was never my intention. My intention, as I said earlier, it was to go to, some, to the essence of something. And for me that essence was in that room, like in the film, with the TV, the sister, the mother, and many things happened in that room. Many, many true things happened in that room. Whether they are okay with it or not. I know what is the truth. But not only mine, but their truth as well. well. What was the reaction when you showed it in Tanke a few weeks ago? <laughs> they were laughing. They were laughing a lot because um, because I think that they are not used to to see the they, because they, they they were because first they recognize the reality shown in the film, the details of the reality, the, the, the concrete details. The, 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 the TV, the, 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 the food, the, the clothes. I was very, very, very um, precise with that. I chose everything you see in the film. I chose, it was my choice, and the flowers, everything. So this reality, I wanted to be recognized by any Moroccan, whether he like, whether he accepts the homosexuality or not. So the fact that they were recognizing the reality with something homosexual in it creates something like in gen, like they were like um, in gen. Not bother, like in gen. They recognize reality but resonance. An uneasy position for them. Et gêné, être gêné par quelque chose. Embarrassed. Kind of embarrassment. Yeah, kind of embarrassment. But at the same time they know about this reality. So in a the only answer was for them is it's, it's a complicated situation for them. So when we are in this kind of we laugh. So they were laughing until the end. <laughs> Even though we're the, at the last scene with the guy, which is a sad scene, where he is, he is singing, the way he is, I asked him to destroy the song. <laughs> they were laughing. But maybe when they will see the film by themselves, alone in a room, that pirate DVD, that will be another story. Yes.
Um, you only fade to black twice, which means very meaningful fade to blacks, which are often overused. Uh, the first time, or, or the second time, was you're on the payphone to your mother, and you tell her that Salim has abandoned you. Uh, but the viewer assumes that he only went off for one night. Um, and then there is the other phone call to the mother on the payphone where he asks, Engineer. how is Salim? Sliman. 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 Uh, um, and I just wondered if there is meaning there. Number one, uh, does he represent the Moroccan son who does not ever go anywhere? And if there is a story uh, and an arc from the first fade uh, with a phone call and... Actually, there are four fades. No, oh, there are. Okay, the okay. question is about the use of fades in the film, but I, I think you were singling out the two payphone scenes, and mm -hmm. you can talk about their significance. Um, th th there are four. Oh. The first one, when he is in, in the terrace and he takes the, the breeze, the breeze, first one, mm -hmm. and then we leave the, heart, the family, uh -huh. then we go with only the two brothers, when he betrays his brother, right. Then, and then ten years later, when he, he, they are all in the terrace, and then in the Geneva, and then when we go to Geneva, just before Geneva, ah, okay, there are four. So okay, well, that's like four. For me, it's uh, four fragments. This film is based on what you call ellipses. 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 Mm -hmm. So if um, I didn't want to explain like with words and with intention intentional emotions for the audience. This is what you have to think, this is what happens. Everything is uh, ambiguity, there is ambiguity on it. And for sure, when the hero is in Geneva, we are in a present time, and everything that he is, the way he became a hard character, is the sub, sub, <coughs> consequence, sub, consequences of everything we saw in the Moroccan period. But I think that the link is easy to to, to, to know. But the film as a struct in this structure is based on the ellipses. <coughs> within between these four fragments and even within the scenes. Within in, within the interior of the scenes. There is for instance the father he seems very much in love with the mother. At some point he beats her, but does he really beat her? We don't know, because it's off the screen. There are a lot of things happening off the screen um, in this film. So it's, the whole film is in, the, this is, because I was talking to, uh, about uh, Egyptian movies. That for me was a reality, on the screen. The Moroccan reality, nothing, you can, there is no place for truth. There is no, no truth. It's, there are truths, but they are always, always invisible. There is no space to say the truth in the reality. And I wanted this ambiguity uh, to become even like an aesthetic in, in, in the film. First of all, I was so lucky she accepted because Anya Buda is uh, like uh, it's, uh, one of the it's one of the top biggest uh, cinematographer in the world. Uh, it's it happened in, uh, really easily. We we gave her the screenplay and she said yes. And I was very lucky that she didn't know Morocco because it's very important. 
the film we made it with really small money. It's uh, eight hundred thousand euros, like one million dollars, something like that. But it's it's nothing because the film is made in two countries, in Morocco and in Switzerland. The restrictions and the fact that she didn't know Morocco, we had to find solutions. We had to go to the Morocco I wanted, not the general idea of Morocco that we all have, because just to say Morocco, even here in America, people have to imagine, to imagine something. And we had, and the fact that she didn't know that well, Morocco, she only visited Tangiers, but in the 70s, and the film is not in, I didn't, it, the book is in Tangier, but that's another decision I made, not to film in Tangier, because Tangier, the city of Tangiers is so much and too much internationally known with uh, Paul Bolt, Jackie Rowak, and uh, Jim Jarmusch just did the film there as well. So, I had to find a place where to reinvent this uh, true and intimate truth I wanted to make. And Anya's Godard, I can tell you that she is um, a guerrier, a warrior. She's, she's a warrior. She's with you all the time. It's, uh, I, was, I was blessed you know, that she... The, 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 the whole shooting of a film, in a way, is a war. Just the fact that you are out there trying to do it, it seems like the whole the world doesn't want you to do the film. It's, it's strange. It's, uh, uh, suddenly, people you don't even know about, they come, they ask questions, and they want. So all this. So luckily for me, Anya Skoda was there, and she uh, she followed me in this intimate Morocco. Put in the very lucky. Time for uh, one last question. Uh, yes. scene is made like, it's the way I filmed it, is, it's like two people when they are fighting, mm -hmm. and at some point, it's whatever the other one, the other says, it doesn't matter. So I, I started the scene at that time, when whatever they say, it will never hit the other one. So, uh, I don't want to give you the... the, the, the to tell you what to feel about that. It's, it's clear that he is becoming clever, that he can read, that he's got a scholarship, that he's going to survive. Because he's already in Geneva. But it doesn't mean that he, that he resolved all, all the neurosis, the psychological system, the hard system he had in Morocco. That's something that will stay in him forever. The end of the film is like um, guillotine. Yeah. I'm very happy I had the courage to do that. <laughs> but at the end there is the song. And it's, it's very important. It's the same song we hear in the beginning of the film. But at the end she is something else. But yet, it's a way to connect between two people. One, the hero. Who will, it's, it's true, it's, it's, he reads a book, he read, he's reading a book. 
is going to an intellectual way. He knows what to do. And there is the other Moroccan who is obviously uh, an immigrant, a loser in a losing. But yet, there is a song destroyed, but they can connect. They can connect. And it's very important. In general, I do believe in life, there is no one who is only good or only good person and bad person. They are all made of the truth. And that's something I wanted to put in the If you think at the end that it is a criminal, I'm happy with that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the film. Thank you.